Hey guys, what is up? Super K Man Rocks here, and I'm here for my LCS week number six overview and analysis video here in the summer split. We are really wrapping up the regular season. This is the penultimate week here in the LCS, at least for the regular season. By the end of this, we are going to know quite a few teams and where they are standing. Potentially, we could have, you know, four or five of the playoff teams locked in, depending on the results this week. We could also see some teams get eliminated from playoff contention, depending on how things go this week. So a lot on the line and you know, some clarity definitely going to be shown at the end of this video. But if you are excited, let me know down in the comments section below. If you want to know my thoughts on the LCS up until this point, of course, check out the playlist up on the iCarb. That's every single week of the LCS done in the exact same format that you are getting here, series by series. So we've covered every single series up until this point. We will continue to do so. But without further ado, let's get right into it. If you are new here, what we are going to do is go series by series, talking about the advantages and the disadvantages that each team was able to generate. All right, I'll be giving my player of the series and my dud of the series for each series that we cover. And then at the end of the video, I will be giving my player of the week and my dud of the week to kind of tie everything into a nice, neat little bow. We will, of course, also be updating my personal power rankings from number one to number eight at the end of the video to give you guys an idea. But spoiler alert, not really a lot of surprises. It's kind of been pretty traditional of the LCS uh, over the course of this year, but... Definitely some consequential outcomes. One matchup in particular that we have been waiting for. The two best teams in the league going head-to-head. -head. Excited to talk about that a bit later. But of course, uh, kicking off the week, we got to start with day number one. We got to go in order, and that means the first series that we are covering is the first series of day one. NRG taking on Dignitas, and Dignitas does pick up the 2-0 series win. This was kind of a destruction from Dig. They were definitely better here. I know that there was some real concern about Dig after last week, rightfully so. They really kind of shit the bed last week, if we're being honest. They underperformed in a pretty major way, losing a series that they really couldn't afford to lose, and they dropped to 1-4. and four. I think the lucky thing for Dig is that literally half the league was 1-4 and four going into this week. All of the bottom four teams were 1-4, and four. and so there still is this giant hole open to even get like a top four seed going into playoffs, which felt like it was going to be a bit impossible for a team like Dig. So you feel pretty good about this win. Getting to 2-4, and four, I think, is a really nice place to be for energy. Dropping down to 2-4. and four. It's not the worst place to be in the entire world, but this is not a particularly good League of Legends team. They are really bad in a couple of pretty key areas, and they're just not consistent at all. Uh, we'll talk about the players that have just been underperforming basically for the whole year, but Starting with Dig, player of the series, this one's super obvious. It's going to go to Jensen. I'm not going to, like, hold any sort of, like, intrigue on this. The mid-gap in this series was absolutely ginormous. Maybe the biggest that I've seen in the LCS over the course of this year. Jensen just massacred Palafox, and we'll get to Palafox in a second. I think a lot of this was more Palafox being bad than it was Jensen being good, but two games of Zeri mid. We're going to see that a bit more throughout the week. We've seen a ton in a lot of the other regions. The LPL, LCK in particular, has played a lot of Zeri mid. This is a really strong pick in the current meta with 80 carries just being in such a good spot with a lot of their items being so strong right now and you know AP junglers or even facilitative junglers being kind of really the only meta no real AD carry junglers right now you know, things like Zeri can really pop off at the current moment, and that's what we saw here. As long as you're able to get some gold, some resources, if you're able to survive laning phase, and all of a sudden you essentially just have an extra AD carry in the mid lane. It's interesting how we've seen the meta develop. As I've talked about a lot, there's a reason things like Ezreal, Ash, and Jin are by far the three most highly prioritized AD carries in the game right now. Not only is utility just strong in general, and not only are all three of those champions just relatively strong, but having a bot side that you can really not give any resources to in the early game that can and just survive on its own and, you know, be useful in the late game regardless of whether or not they're super far ahead. That is incredibly valuable because you do want to put all of your resources in the middle of the map right now with these AD carries. And so having something like Zeri just makes it a lot easier to win games in the back half, especially if you get as fed as Jensen got his best series of the year by a considerable margin. I do want to give a big shout out to Spika as well. He's gotten a lot of criticism and a lot of it is rightfully so. He's not been particularly good this split. He's kind of been a lower to middle of the pack kind of jungler and that's really not what the expectation was for him coming in to summer but at the end of the day like as long as he's able to get on track when it matters the most it's not really going to matter if he was underperforming for a lot of this split I think there are highlights and, and positive notions to kind of cling on to if you're hoping for a bounce back from him later on in the playoffs or something like that I do think it's possible there are flashes of it I just wish he could do it against players that weren't struggling as hard as someone like contracts is struggling right now but at the end of the day it was a good series and that's good to see licorice was fine two games of Skarner definitely a bit concerning the champion's not particularly really good right now, but 
Whatever works, works, I guess. And then Sven and Isles were, were solid. Sven's been the best player and most consistent player on this team throughout the entirety of this split. And Isles is a solid player, not a star, but good enough for you to be able to win with here. So good for Dig. Jensen looked amazing, and hopefully they can keep this momentum up. But for energy, I mean, it's just a disaster. This team has so many flaws right now. And it's funny because I do think that they're like a lot of the negative energy around this team is being pointed in the wrong direction, in my opinion, or at least it has been in previous weeks. And I've talked about that a lot on this channel. I think the bot lane's actually been pretty good for this this team. FBI and Huhi have done a lot in the early 2v2 to actually establish, you know, pressure and, you know, do things, especially in this meta where winning 2v2 is actually kind of hard to do, at least, you know, a lot. Winning it, like, I guess convincingly, like, that's difficult to do at the current moment with just the way the meta has broken out. I thought FBI and Huhi were pretty good here, and FBI in particular didn't really make any mistakes. He wasn't the problem. Dokla obviously was also very aggressive, was often looking for plays here on the Rumble, but Jungle Mid has been a disaster for this team. There really is no other way to put it. Contracts has been one of the worst junglers in the LCS over the course of this split. Just kind of fits the narrative for contracts that I hate to say, which is gets a shot on a new team, looks really good for the first split or two, and then, you know, falls back down to where he was before, you know, the reason he got let go from whatever previous team he was playing for. This has been a pretty consistent trend with him over the course of his career is look really good in the first year or so with the new org and not be able to carry that over. So I hope that that trend just doesn't last because it is a bit frustrating and he's not playing well. Like he is just not doing well at the current moment. And this is a meta that he theoretically should be very strong in. And then for Palafox, I, I don't even really know what to say. He has been pretty bad over the course of this split. He's going to get dead of the series. This might be the worst mid lane performance I've seen in the LCS all year. It's certainly up there. I mean, just completely zero pressure. I get that Palafox is a bit more explainable in the fact that he is out of meta. Like these 80 carries in the mid lane, it's not what Palafox is good at. He wants to either be playing assassins like LeBlanc or like Akali. That's kind of the thing that I know him for, or Oriana and a lot of these other control mages, like those are the two things that he does at a really high level. Lucian is not one of them, and he continues to try and pull that off because it is meta. It's just not working for this team, and Palafox is really struggling because of it. I do think some of his problems are a little bit overstated. I feel like, to me, Contrax has clearly been the weakest player on energy over the course of this split, but I do understand the negative feelings towards Palafox, and this series certainly isn't helping because of just how bad it was. Energy is just not a team I really believe in. I get that their record is fine at two and four. They're going to be somewhere near the top five, and they almost certainly will make playoffs off the fact that they've won two series alone. That's crazy to say, but that's just where we're at in the LCS, but... I don't expect this team to do anything. This is not a world's team. This is a shell of the team that won the LCS finals last year. And for the most part, it's because of the players that stayed and not because of the new additions. And then for Dignitas on the other side, you know, they're fine. Hopefully they can keep this momentum going. All they need to do is be better than the bad teams. Like, I'm not expecting them to be top three. I'm not expecting them to be anywhere near that upper echelon of teams. But if you can compete for top four and just be relevant, I think that that will satisfy a lot of people's expectations for what this team could be. And at the very least in this series, that's what they were. And then moving on to our second series of day number one and a battle of one in four teams, although that was pretty likely this week. It's 100 Thieves taking on Immortals and 100 Thieves is going to be picking up the victory again. Not an upset here. I moved Immortals down to number eight in my power rankings last week. I get that Shopify has been really bad, but at the very least, Shopify it has some reason to believe that this could be a good meta for them with Insanity kind of being the AD carry mid player in the LCS and Immortals really having nothing going for them. And honestly, that's so far has tracked really well for 100 Thieves. They make a roster change going into this week. Meech is out. Looks like it was his decision. I hope that that is actually the case. But Tomo is in. And if you know me and if you know the channel, if you've been following my NACL coverage, or honestly, if you just watched my spring coverage last split, you'll know that I think this is a pretty big upgrade. I think Tomo is a pretty good player at the LCS level. And he came in and really solidified stuff for this team. He was really good. He's not quite going to get player of the series, but he is going to help 100 Thieves get to that victory spot. I think the thing about Tomo that I really want to talk about first is, like, wh what can you expect as an upgrade from him? Laning phase. That is really where he excels. He is a very aggressive player. It's something you don't really see a lot of in the LCS right now. Really globally, not a lot of the AD carries that we see at the top level are playing super aggro. Even the ones that are kind of known for being aggro, like Jackie Love, are playing a little bit safer, being a little bit more weak side. In the current meta, Tomo is just not that kind of player. He is somebody who loves to have resources, he loves to play strong side, and he loves to try to win 2v2. It's something that we're really not 
seeing a lot consistently out of a lot of other players. So I think he is going to add that variable to 100 Thieves where their early games might be a tad bit more consistent because he is good in that phase. He's really not a bad carry either. He has been dragging the corpse of DSG for a lot of this split. Not that DSG is horrible, just that he has really been the focal point for how they've wanted to play the game. And Tomo has done a really good job at being able to capitalize on the resources he does get. So I feel pretty confident that this is going to be an upgrade. I thought he was clearly like a top, you know, four, top five at worst, like 80 carry in the LCS last split. And I think he might even be better going into this split with a lot of the underperformances from other ADCs. And we saw that here. He was just better than tactical, although I am lower on tactical. That game number two was really bad on Callista. So congrats to Tomo. He looks good, but he's not going to get player of the series, even though he came in and kind of reignited the team. That simply has to go to Quid. He was the most valuable player for 100 Thieves in this series. The Lucian, the Yone, both games were incredibly good. And it's really important that Quid gets back on track. Again, if he's going to be able to start snowballing games, if he's able to win early, like that was 100 Thieves strategy last split. The reason they got the number two seed going into the playoffs and, you know, finished in the top four is because Quid was able to win early and kind of translate that into a lot of success. River, of course, is, you know, kind of a big plus in that regard, but I think having a bot lane that can win as well kind of takes some pressure off of Quid. He's received a lot of pressure from opposing junglers over the course of this year, and he, you just can't really do that if bot lane or top lane are going to be able to punish you in the way that they have been able to do over the past couple of weeks, and so I think Quid getting back on track is huge. Sniper continues to be solid. He has gotten better over the course of this split, which is really nice. I think we all went in with pretty high expectations after a really good spring. It's been an okay summer for the most part. It's kind of been a down summer, but I think over the last two weeks in particular, it's looked pretty good. River, I think, is starting to get his form back. This has really not been his meta, and I, I think we've definitely seen that. He has honestly not been nearly what he was in spring so far in the summer split, but again, if bot lane's better, if top lane's better, River's job's easier, Quid's job is easier, and all of a sudden, maybe you can start getting back to the things you were good at last spring. And then for Immortals, this team just sucks. Like, there's genuinely almost nothing to say. I think their best player is Tactical, and I think Tactical is overrated. So, I mean, that should give you an idea of where I think Immortals is at. At this point, I think Ole is not an LCS caliber player. I think Castle continues to get worse on a team that is just bad. Mask wasn't particularly good to begin with. He's not making the most amount of mistakes, but he's really not helping the team. And then, dud of the series, it's going to go to Armeo. This team has lost five series, and he's gotten dud of the series in four of them. I mean, there's just no argument. He is the worst player right now in the LCS. Sometimes I do think that the context surrounding why Armeo is playing so bad is lost upon the community. I don't think that he's necessarily the worst player in the universe, although I certainly don't think he's the best player in the universe. I think he is the kind of player that relies super heavily on winning lanes in the early game. It's why he's done so well at the NACL level when he's on Team Liquid Challengers. It's why he was okay at the very least when he was on TSM. He was pretty good for Evil Geniuses last year. Like, a lot of the good from that is, oh, I've got a mid lane that's constantly winning, or I've got a bot lane that's constantly winning 2v2, and then I know exactly what to do with those winning resources to move it around the map. Uh, when he has a ton of losing lanes, he is a fish out of water. He is literally incapable of playing the game, and that has become clear. He, this is just not a situation where he was ever going to look even passable in, and he's not looking passable. He is, like, as Kobe said on the cast, giga useless, and so there's genuinely nothing I can say about Armeo at this point that hasn't already been said, maybe I guess technically I've defended him a bit. I'm honestly just trying to add context to the situation. I don't think it makes it better. I don't think I'm trying to defend him. I don't think he's the kind of player that will even have a shot of being in LCS next year after how he is played here, but Immortals is bad around him. It's not just our male. Like, Castle and Mask, I don't think have been particularly strong imports. Even if I did like Mask's tape and Castle had some upside, uh, Immortals was not the team to bring that out of them, and then, you know, again, I think Tactical is already overrated. Ole is certainly overrated, and so... I don't, I don't have any faith in Immortals. This team is bad, and they're sitting at 2-10. and 10. Like, they deserve this record. And then for 100 Thieves, you know, they're fine. I, again, they're in that same cluster to me as Energy and to an extent Dignitas, where they have upside. There is a realistic idea that they could go and perform well in certain situations, but this is not a team that's ever going to be competing for top three. They are not even remotely in the conversation until things completely change. Maybe Tomo does make their floor a bit higher, and maybe that can prop them up to maybe number four in the rankings. But at the end of the day, I just don't really see this team... Like like making a big difference even with a win here over Immortals. But then now moving on to our second day of week number six, and this is the matchup we've all been waiting for. This is the one that not only we've been waiting for this week, but basically for the whole split up until this point, the two best teams in the LCS as of this moment, Team Liquid taking on Cloud9. 
and Team Liquid is going to pick up the 2-1 series win. This was pretty back and forth. I would say this was a pretty good series from both teams. I think that there were a lot of positives from both of these teams. Some of the things we've really been praising from C9 recently that have turned around a lot of their form from the spring split were active here. I think that there are definitely some positives to take away, but there is no more debate. Team Liquid has snatched that number one spot in the rankings, in the standings, everywhere. You know, we were waiting on this series to really kind of determine who was better, at least I was. I know a lot of people just assumed it was Team Liquid. I really wanted to see them do it because I think on paper C9 maybe has a bit more of an upside kind of thing. It's why I put them number one in my preseason. I've had no reason to change either of them with both of them coming in undefeated into this week, but Team Liquid finally snatches that number one spot and you just have to be excited for this team. Player of the series is going to go to Impact. I, what do you want me to say? Impact is currently maybe having his best split ever. It's so strange. It's so fun to watch and it's really interesting. I think this team plays around top lane in a very intriguing kind of way where they really allow him to just kind of win early. This was something he was always really bad at at other parts of his career. I don't know if it's because top laners in the LCS have gotten worse or if the meta is just different or, or, or if Impact has really worked on it or whatever it is, but Impact has gone from being the guy on, you know, Cloud9 and Liquid the first time in Evil Geniuses that is known for going even or even a little bit behind in lane to absolutely dominating team fights, especially on Evil Geniuses. That was kind of the MO on Impact to now just winning lane every single game. It's really funny to watch and you have to give him all the credit in the world for it. He is just really, really good at the game of League of Legends and for a guy who won Worlds over a decade ago, he is still playing at potentially his highest level, which is genuinely insane. And then you got to shout out Jan and Kor. They were excellent here. Jan in particular has really snatched that number one AD carry spot in the LCS. It's not even really all that close at this point. Jan is so clearly the best AD carry in North America. And that's awesome to see the development that he's been able to make. I was always a huge fan of Jan in the NACL. Uh, if you go back and watch a lot of the videos I did on him in like 2021, 2022, before he got the call up, like I was always very excited excited about him as a prospect and you know him and Ayla I thought were awesome to watch and he has even exceeded my expectations here at the LCS level he has clearly become the most dominant laner regardless of position in the LCS he is just not able to lose a 2v2 even when Berserker is playing really well Berserker and Vulcan were awesome in this series and it just didn't matter Jan and Kor were simply just a little bit better APA continues to look solid didn't really have to do a whole ton this series he was kind of able to fade into the background a bit more that's really nice because he has been such a focal point for what they've wanted to do over the course of this year, it's nice to know they can win even if he is a bit more of a, you know, supportive player. And Umti, again, he fits really well into this meta. He gets by Ivern and Maokai and Zajwani every single game. That's what he wants to do. They're really the only team that has been doing that consistently over the course of this split. When everybody else was experimenting with a lot of these AP junglers, Team Liquid was sticking with the tanks. And now that the tanks are back, as they always are at the end of splits when teams want to get more consistency going into playoffs, they're the ones with the most experience in that format. So... I feel really good about Team Liquid. They are clearly the best team in the LCS, and there is no longer a, a way to underrate them. I mean, this team might not be on paper the scariest thing you've ever seen, but clearly in execution, they are one of the scariest teams in the world. But for Cloud9, like, I honestly don't feel all that bad about them coming out of this series. They played relatively well. I think that there were definitely some positives. There were some miscommunications, and I think that the synergy is definitely going to be the biggest question mark about C9 moving forward. It's, you know, can JoJo really lock in in these pivotal games? He builds random wins on Yone and is useless in game number three, which is never ideal. Can Thanatos be on the same page as the rest of this team? He had a couple of good individual moments, but when it came to coordinated team plays, he was often lagging behind all nine other players in this series, which is just not acceptable for someone like him. Vulcan and Berserker were awesome. Blabber definitely had some bad moments down the stretch here, but that's just naturally going to happen when you're playing Sedge, and the other team is really far ahead, so I'm not going to blame him too heavily, even though I do think he could have been better, but JoJo is going to get done of the series for me. Like I said, there's just really no excuse building what he did in game number three, going the Yone in game three. I think Yone's in a really good spot. I think AD carries in the mid lane are in a really good spot. And Yone is one of the champions that can build a lot of the broken ADC items and still do a lot of those things. The problem is JoJo didn't want to invest in a lot of those aggressive items, instead wanted to play a little bit more of a well-rounded mid lane game. And that's just not what's meta at the current moment. I'm not going to say that JoJo's having his worst split ever. I feel like that is, you know, hyperbole in terms of the way that things have gone because Cloud9 was undefeated up until this point. But I don't remember a split ever where JoJo Jojo was invested in less than he has been in this split. He has really been kind of the forgotten member of C9 in terms of where the resources are going right now. I think at times that can be a positive. Unfortunately, in this series, it was a bit of a negative. So he's going to get my debt of the series, but... 
He was pretty good on the Zeri games, and that should go to show you that C9 really didn't play bad at all. I think that there are a few things they need to clean up, but this is a significantly better version of this team than what they were in the spring split, and that became very clear in this series. It's not just the bad teams that they're able to beat. They're able to hold their own against a team like Team Liquid, and I think that that was, you know, good to see. I think they're right in the mix with FlyQuest for that number two spot, but Team Liquid very much has cleared that up. I think uh, not to take pot shots at the LEC, because I honestly don't hate the LEC. I'm not trying to be biased or anything like that, but after watching the LEC playoffs, seeing two NA teams actually come out and play what is, in my opinion, pretty good League of Legends, and for both of them to look like they are teams that could potentially do something at the international level, I think it's really cool. I know a lot of that excitement's going to be completely destroyed once we actually get out of the domestic season, once these teams actually go to Worlds and get absolutely blasted, but at least for now, it's nice to see that they're playing, you know, pretty aesthetically pleasing League. And then moving on to our final series of the week here, and this one was definitely a bit more predictable, but actually still kind of close. FlyQuest taking on Shopify Rebellion, and FlyQuest is going to pick up the 2-1 win, but honestly, Shopify already looks so much better than they have looked at basically any point this year leading up to this. I think reinserting Boogie in here has been nothing but a positive, even if he was pretty horrible in this third and final game. I think generally you're starting to get better performances out of some other players. You know, we'll talk about Fake God. He is almost the star of the show in this series as a whole. I think Insanity, as I've said, is certainly a, a lot more in meta than maybe a lot of the other mid laners right now in the LCS, and that can definitely be a positive. There are definitely good things to take away from Shopify, and as much as we've been clowning on them, they're still not out of the playoff race. It is technically still possible for them to get in there, because as we've said, like two wins might be enough, depending on how things go next week, but for FlyQuest, this is a nice win. I think this team is playing pretty well at the moment. We're really going to get a better idea of where they stand next week. They have essentially been undefeated ever since losing to Team Liquid in week number one. If they're going to be able to take on Cloud9 next week and be able to beat them, that's a really good sign that this team is in a pretty similar spot to what they were in last split, which is the clear number two team in the LCS. In fact, for a lot of the regular season last split, they were the number one team. So, you know, some things to talk about, but player of the series, it's going to go once again to Inspired. I know people are talking about how the MVP race is kind of being run away with by Impact right now, and I'm certainly, like, pro that. You know, I'm not going to try to spoil who I'm going to be giving MVP to because I don't really know yet at the end of this split, but Impact is certainly, you know, the heavy favorite, I would say, but Inspired is a lot closer to that, I think, than a lot of people are giving him credit for. He has clearly been the number two so far in the league. It's so funny because I just did my LEC, kind of like season finals preview video where I did all my awards yesterday, and I talked a lot about Razork in that video. I think Inspired and Razork really have a lot of similarities. I think Inspired is a bit more consistent in the late game. Razork, obviously, a little bit more deterministic in terms of his early games, but um, Inspired actually has a lot of the same, like, inconsistent trends, and I think in the right situations, both of them can look like elite world-class junglers, and Inspired is kind of looking like that right now. It's never really been a concern, though, about whether or not he's able to dominate domestically. He's done that both in the LEC and the LCS every single split that he's played. I think the consistency thing for me this split that has really raised him up is just his ability to play around objectives. He has really been dominating in terms of what he's able to strangle out of the enemy team, take away resources from the teams that he's playing against and the players that he's playing against. It is very difficult to play into Inspired in the mid-game, and if you're going to do that and also also probably be the best team fighting jungler in the entire region. That's ginormous. So really in on Inspired right now. It's almost under the radar how good he's been. Quad also was significantly better in this series. I haven't been like blown away by Quad. He's been good. I'm certainly not going to try to say he's been bad, but he's just kind of been a guy, and I hate to say it. It's basically exactly what I expected him to be going into the split. I was always a bit lower on Quad because I've watched him for so long throughout his career because I was a DRX fan in 2021 when he was Sulka. Like, I knew what he looked like, and I knew what his problems were, you know, on Nongshim and even in the NACL at times, but he has adapted well. Well, I think to a lower resource role and, you know, a position where he doesn't need nearly as many things to help him go right. I think the Corky was actually really solid here, and this was one of his more complete series for me. You know, Masu continues to be fine. Busio was a little bit over aggressive, but for the most part, it was fine. Whippo also not perfect in this series. Fake God was phenomenal for Shopify, which we will definitely get into, but for the most part, Fly won through the middle of the map, which is, as I've said multiple times on this channel, the most important part of the game right now, so you can't really be too frustrated with that. For Shopify on the other side, we gotta start with Fake God because this was like a legacy-defining series. He was very close to getting player of the series as a whole for me. Inspired was really good, which is why he got it, but if Fly was just kind of a well-oiled unit where basically everybody played well and you can't really attribute a lot of the success to one individual player, Fake God probably would have gotten it because, man, was he dominant in this series. Just a phenomenal showing from a top laner that, for the most part, has not looked LCS caliber over this year so far. 
I've been a huge fan of Fake God basically his entire run, uh, going back to like 2017, 2018 when he was in the 100 Thieves system. Obviously, uh, I defended the Dignitas days. He's always been one of my number one or number two top laners in the NACL or an academy or whatever it's been called at the time. Um, Fake God is just somebody who I've always believed in and thought if he got a real shot at the LCS level, he would be really good. And this has felt like the first like real opportunity he's gotten not on a team in Dig. That's a disaster. Not on a team in 100 Thieves that is subbing out someday for him, which is just an unfair expectation. This this is really the first chance and it's really not been great but there are like the games like this that they, they are encouraging enough for me to believe that there is still a lot of room for him to grow into being a very capable and solid top laner I gotta see it more consistently but this is such a good sign it's hard to completely ignore it and then I do want to give a big shout out to Boogie I get it he was really bad in game number three but he stabilized this team so hard Tomio was just not doing a lot for them he was one of the weaker players in the entire league putting Boogie back in has been nothing but a raw upgrade and quite frankly he is the sole reason and this team is still in playoff contention with their win last week and their game win here against FlyQuest to take them out of last place. I still think B-Boy is good. Maybe not quite as good as he was in spring. He's kind of just been a guy on this team, but the rest of the team has also been at times a bit of a disaster. I'm not going to blame him entirely, but he's not but he's not been nearly as impressive in the 2v2 I think as he was last split. Part of that is Zazel, who is going to get my dud of the series. You know, a lot of really aggressive engage opportunities here for Zazel that I just think were over eager. That last one in Game 3 on the rail where he basically missed everything. It's pretty indicative of the series as a whole. I just don't think Zazel's been particularly good this year. You know, somebody who has obviously made the semifinals of Worlds in the past, you expect him to have a pretty high floor. It's not really been the case. He's really not been that great for Shopify. I think he's been one of the weaker players for them over the course of this split, but there are upsides. And again, for a team that was winless, not only in terms of series, but in games before last week, they were literally 0-8 last, going into last week. For that team to now be sitting at, you know, 3-10, and at, at 1-5, and but with a chance to make playoffs and looking relatively good against one of the top three teams in the league, you can probably live with that. Hopefully they can, you know, make things end up working out because I'd actually love to see this team in the top six. And then for FlyQuest, you know, inspired, he's really good, but the rest of this team, I, I still want to see some more consistency develop out of them. Masu and Busio have been great the last few weeks and for the most part over the course of this whole split, but this week, a little bit more lackluster. Bwipo hasn't found that consistency. Quad, not somebody that I really believe in in terms of game-to-game -game consistency. It's always been his biggest weakness. So Fly is really good, but their next week's matchup against Cloud9 is really going to show a lot as to what their upside could be. All right, but that is going to do it for my LCS week number six overview and analysis video here in the summer split up on the screen. Now, the updated standings after six weeks of action here in the LCS. We've got quite a few interesting things to talk about. First and foremost, we now have four official teams that have qualified for the playoffs with Dignitas getting that win and moving to six and eight in particular in terms of their game score. There is no way that they can be taken out of the playoffs because of the way that the schedule works and because of the way that the final teams are playing against each other. They just, they can't miss it. They are guaranteed regardless of if they lose 0-2 next week, if they end the season at two and five, six and 10, they are still in the playoffs. So they have officially locked it. That means all of the top four have locked two spots or open, but it is only between three teams and not four because Immortals has officially been eliminated from playoff contention. Yes, they are sitting at the same record as Shopify, but they are one game below, even if they were to go two and five to, you know, four and ten next week. There is no way that they can have a better win percentage than 100 Thieves or NRG, and that means that they are out. Shopify still has that in there, depending on what happens to all three of these teams later. We'll talk about why I don't think they necessarily have a great chance, but We'll do that by going over my personal power rankings, which you can see next to the power rank thing on the right-hand side of all of these teams. The number is, of course, 1 through 8, where I rank them. Change is how they have changed from last week to this week. Only one change, and it's going to be Team Liquid officially jumping Cloud9. You know, I've kind of wanted to do this for a couple of weeks, as I've hinted at on this channel, ever since the Esports World Cup. I felt pretty good about Team Liquid. I just needed a reason, and this was the reason. Now, I want to make it clear, this doesn't mean that I'm, like, taking back my thoughts of, oh, uh, you know, he was actually a Team Liquid hater, and now he's trying to cover it up. I understand how it can be perceived as such, but really for the most part, how I view this is Cloud9 and Team Liquid were both very good and Team Liquid just proved that they were better. I always kind of saw them as 1A, 1B and Team Liquid has proven that they are not just 1B. They are clearly 1, period, and, and Cloud9 is 2. So that is a really nice win to move them up to 1. Cloud9 will move down to 2, but everything else has kind of fallen into place for me. I've kept these power rankings basically identical throughout the entire split. I haven't moved Fly, I haven't moved Dig, I haven't moved 100 Thieves, I haven't moved Energy since week number 1 and they've just 
kind of fallen into place into order that into the order that we expected and so I'm not really going to change them the only matchup that's going to be super important next week is going to be 100 Thieves taking on Shopify Rebellion if Shopify can pick up a win there there is a very good shot that they actually end up in the playoffs of course energy is on the you know precipice as well but they play Team Liquid not a great place for them to be so we'll see what ends up happening but there is definitely a lot still be still to be determined unfortunately I do think 100 Thieves is just better than Shopify especially if Tomo is going to come in and solidify the bottom side of their map but you know we'll see what happens there is room for some interesting upsets let me know who you think will be the final two teams to make the playoffs who do you think will be the team on the outs there in seventh place would love to know your thoughts and opinions down below but of course it's time to move into my player of the week and my dud of the week as a whole here player of the week for me is actually going to go to Inspired the jungler for FlyQuest. I feel like Jensen is the really obvious answer here that I think a lot of other people are going to go with. I thought Inspired played better and in, in a higher volume series. I think that the series against Shopify was kind of difficult and there were some good performances coming in from the Shopify side but Inspired was still able to take advantage of a player in Boogie who has clearly shown himself to be LCS capable and was able to just kind of dominate those games. I think Inspired is very like under the radar in terms of the MVP conversation and I think there are going to be real votes for him moving forward. Forward, but the honorable mentions, that's where I'm going to put Jensen. He definitely deserves at the very least an honorable mention for this week. Two amazing games in the mid lane where he just abused Palafox, who we will get to in a second. And then Quid, the uh, mid laner for 100 Thieves. This could be basically anybody on Team Liquid as well. Whether you wanted it to be Impact or Yawn or whoever you really wanted on Team Liquid, they looked really good in that series against Cloud9. I just thought Quid stood out a bit more in terms of dominance, and I really wanted to give him a shout out here. So uh, those two are going to be my honorable mentions, and Inspired is going to get my player of the week. But my dud of the week, this one was super obvious. It's going to go to Palafox. 0-8-3. I mean, it's one of the weakest performances that I've seen come out of the mid lane in a long time. This is not Palafox's meta in terms of playing things like Lucian a ton. He just doesn't really do it at a high level, and it's becoming a bit of a problem for energy. You know, he's had some bad performances. I don't think any of them stack up against this one. Uh, the reason Jensen didn't get player of the week is because I thought a lot of that lane and a lot of that series was Palafox playing bad, and not so much Jensen, like, being phenomenal. So... Palafox, pretty easy choice for Dead of the Week. Hopefully him and Energy can bounce back, and then Inspired is going to get my Player of the Week, but... That's going to do it. I do hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, leave a like. It really does mean a lot to me. It lets me know you guys are enjoying the content, and it does help get this video out to a lot more people, which I'm always very appreciative of. If you're new here, hit the subscribe button. We don't only post about the LCS on this channel. We post about all four of the major regions, LEC, LCK, LPL as well, and with all the playoffs, kind of either just around the corner or starting in the LPL and LEC's case, this is a great time to hit subscribe. We also cover the NACL, Tier 2 here in North America, so if you want a comprehensive overview of everything going on in LOL Esports, this is the place for hit subscribe and hit that bell so you can be notified when those videos do go live but of course with all that being said i hope you are having a great day i hope you continue to have a great day and i will see you all later